Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review, part 10, and this is session 63. And if you're looking at the PowerPoint heading, the date is not February 24th, it is March the 3rd. Sorry, my mistake. And uh, I want to say a couple of things right here at the outset. Today we're changing up just a little bit, just a little bit. I am, for reasons I will discuss with you when we get there, I am cutting the second session a little bit short because I'm going to give us some time at the end of the second session to have a discussion together about the things that we have covered over the last few weeks. Um, we finished up relationship prayer. I pretty much, pretty much said everything I have to say to you about that. And today we're going to be looking at edification prayer. And that's going to be a little bit different. So I want us to get this down. And so at the end, it is important that we have a time of interactive learning. So that as a group, we really are moving together and we're all on the same page, and if we have any questions, we get those answered. And this is going to be critical because um, when we get into Romans 12, the first part of our godly living uh, is going to necessitate this group being able to function as a single body and for us to be able to um, to function in some very particular ways. I'll talk to you about that at the end. But anyway, I just want to have a short word with you at the end about things that are coming along uh, and then, and then um, anyway, we'll, we'll go from there. So I just want to kind of give you a heads up on that. So um, let me just say today what, what we're going to do. I'm going to give you some post-doctrinal exhortations on relationship prayer. If you remember the, back from Sonship Orientation, I haven't forgotten, Mark, I just want you to know. If you, if you remember, there was pre-doctrinal exhortations and what those are like I, I told you to think of that as the like if we were painting think of that as the primer coat then think of the doctrine as the paint and what does the primer do it helps the paint to stick so what we're doing, and, and, and how does the pre-doctrinal exhortation do, do that? It talks to us about how important it is, what, what, what we are about to hear, the importance of it. And, um, and so that's supposed to, the pre-doctrinal exhortation is supposed to make you realize, oh, what we're about to cover is going to do this. And then, uh, then we get the doctrine. And then... There is a post-doctrinal exhortation. And you know what? Since I had the paint analogy going, <laughs> that's like the clear coat. It protects the paint. In other words, it preserves the doctrine. That's what, well, clear coat does that with paint. And what you're getting here is a doctrinal exhortation that is meant to cause you to hold on to the doctrine, uh, to remember what it is that this doctrine is producing. And so what I'm going to do, because I've already, we've already done this and we've already done this, giving you the doctrine on relationship prayer, today what I'm going to do is give us some post-doctrinal exhortations along with a few warnings things that we just need to be watching out for, some potential pitfalls, so to speak. And, um, 
and then I'm going to give us the solution. If we happen to find ourselves in, 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 in a situation that is uh, uh, dangerous to the doctrine, how to, how to handle that, and then we're going to talk about edification prayer, which is the next kind of prayer that we need to get familiar with, and we're going to look at the mechanical means of that. So before I do that, uh, I asked Mark to uh, come up and say something about relationship prayer. Now look, I've gotten some communication from folks in this group that told me that you're doing this and, and that, you know, what it, kind of what it means. And I wanted Mark to come up and do that as well. And I asked him to do it on the tape because I'm trying to do everything I can to, to encourage us in this uh, relationship prayer. We don't, we, where we are, don't have much time left before this becomes critical. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thanks. So I'm the guinea pig. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I was talking to uh, Mike a few weeks ago about when he revealed the mercies and how we should be praying through the mercies, it was like a piece of the puzzle that came together for me because I don't know if you guys were like me, prayer was really... I knew I didn't know how I ought to pray as I ought, as Paul had stated, but I didn't know how I needed to pray at all. So, so I didn't want prayer to be just liturgy, you know. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul, you know, that kind of thing, which we grew up in, if you were in other religions, that's how you learned to pray. So I just stopped praying altogether and just trying to have conversations with God, but not really knowing what to talk about, it became really stagnant. But this made me came to realize that I was missing a big part. And when he revealed the fact that we should be praying about the mercies, it, it, it just uncovered a whole bunch of things in my life that I thought, wow, this puts everything in perspective. If we would have started praying back in Romans three, four, when we got our first mercy and started praying like that, we would have had that in us already. We would have started already talking about the things that God has done for us. And then we would be prepared with those things in our heart as we go into the things that are need to effectually work in our lives when we get to Romans 12, 1, 2, 3, and we start the education in love. Because you realize how much God loves you by his mercies. And if you don't understand God's mercies and his love for you, it's very difficult to love the body. I mean, we can love each other from a fleshly standpoint, but not like God. I was thinking about several um, things this weekend about uh, going to a funeral of a dear friend that just passed away and how... Oh, I wish he would have known some things because he was suffering greatly. Man, he is in heaven now, and I believe that. He is probably wishing that he would have known some more things by now. And uh, there's just these mercies kind of tie everything in for me. And that's, that's really what I wanted to say because we've got to have the love of God in us. We need to be able to think like God and the beginning of that for us, and it's just the beginning, is those mercies. So that's all I really wanted to say. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, um, I'm going to shut off, I'm going to mute this just for a second where I can weave this back into my shirt. So give me just a second. Okay, uh, look, we really have to get to the place where this body is able to do some mutual edifying, where we're going to be able to encourage each other in this. I hope that what we are all doing is practicing this relationship prayer. 
Last week, I handed out a booklet, didn't I? Was that last week that I handed out the booklet? 40 pages to explain those mercies. And um, I, look, I'm just going to talk about this for a moment. I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you because I said this is a post-doctrinal exhortation. In other words, you've already gotten the instruction about relationship prayer. We must begin to engage in this. I'm not trying to be a tutor governor when I say that, but I'm saying it from the standpoint of if we're going to be the sons that we are, are committing to be, this cannot be optional. Uh, we must do this. And, and so I'm going to say this right here. The time for us is short because I didn't know to do this back when we should have. Milt, you want to give me a hand and pass this, help me pass this out? I don't have this on a PowerPoint slide. I wish I did. But, you know, I was thinking uh, yesterday, and so uh, Billy and I go out to the office last night, and I'm thinking I have to have a way to illustrate this. So I know there are folks that are following along with us, and for them, the time is short too. Now look, I'm not trying to insult anybody here. There's probably someone that's watching this that maybe they figured this out and they've been doing this. And I am really glad if that is the case because that's going to put you right where you ought to be. I started to say ahead of the game. You won't be ahead of the game, but you'll be right where you're supposed to be. But I've got a feeling that most folks around the country because here's what, we, here's what we know. We know not to pray for the physical things, for God to intervene in those. So what we do is we just wind up praying for the spiritual things, but without really anything else accompanying that. So we, we pray for our inner man to be strengthened. Or we pray for patient endurance. Or we, we pray for those kinds of things, but really... There's nothing else happening that's going to make that happen. And you already know that we're not supposed to look at prayer like that's the only thing we do and then God goes and does stuff about it. But prayer is part of a process by which those things get done. When, when I, I was talking to Mark this morning and, and, and I was thinking in the old days because this would have been if I say it to you, it won't be the same as doing it. But what I'm, um, what I'm, what I'm going to say is, in the old days, what I would have done is I would, I would have, remember when I talked to you a week ago and I said, I would have loved to have gotten a cartoon figure of maybe some praying hands, put some feet and arms and a head on it, and then gotten a cartoon figure of the Bible and, and put some legs and arms and a head on it, and had them holding each other's hand because I was talking about you can't separate prayer and the Word. But I just, you know, I, I came to that too late to, to utilize it. What I, if this was the old days, what I started to say, you know what I would have been doing? I would have been getting a costume together of praying hands that someone would put over them with their arms poking out and their legs, of course, and, um, and their head would just be inside. And, what I'd have, and then I'd have someone else putting on a costume that looked like the Bible, and I would have had them walk out where you are and have one of them grab you on one hand and grab the other one grab you on the other hand and say to you, think about this, this is how prayer is supposed to work. And if I could have done that, you, because we think in pictures. Do you ever notice how you think? It's not lines of type. You get a concept. You get a picture in your mind. Now you may use words to articulate that thing, just like I'm doing now. I'm just using words to paint the picture. I think it would have been great if I could have had a couple of people dressed up in those costumes and they could have come out and, and one of them could have grabbed Sarita on one side and another one grabbed her on the other side 
and then for me to say, Sarita, this is how prayer is meant to work. And actually, there's more to it than that. We'll talk about it when we get into the lesson. But you know what? I didn't have time to create costumes. I wish I had, but I didn't. So again, we're right here at the end. So I'm going to say it to you this way. That thing that you're holding in your hands, that, that is a treasure map. This is what I went out last night after I had already done the notes for today and done the PowerPoint. So I don't even have this on the PowerPoint. But <laughs> this is the way we should have encountered these mercies. So if you start over at the bottom left, those are all chapter and verse markings in the book of Romans. All right, okay, now look. Before we look at that, let me just say this to you. Just, just listen to this. When I gave you the list of all those mercies, I gave you things that are mercies that we haven't yet encountered. Some of them we have, and some of those were yet future because of where we are in the book of Romans. What is on this map and the little red dotted line, it's just, think of that as your journey from starting the book of Romans to the other end, right over in the middle on the far right, you see chapter 12 and verse 1, there's the sonship checkpoint. So there's your journey. And in the book of Romans, folks, I have given you 18 mercies that we need to be praying about. Those are important. And, the re and they're important for a couple of reasons, and that's what I'm going to talk about when I get into the lesson proper. But if you'll look here, when we get to chapter 3 and verse 26, that is when you are introduced to the fact that you have been justified. You haven't been given all the parts of it yet, that's going to start in chapter 4, verse 7. But you're talked about being justified. So, <coughs> there's the first thing we should have been praying about and thanking God for, that we have been justified unto eternal life. Then when you get to chapter 4 and verse 7, we learn the first component of that justification. And that is that we have forgiveness of every sin. So when we got to chapter 4, verse 7, you should have added that to your prayer. I should have told you to do that, but I didn't. And so then, of course, the next one is imputed righteousness. And that is chapter 4, uh, chapter, uh, 4 and verse 22. Now, by the way, those are all listed right up at the top of this little treasure map. And, and so all you have to do is look up there and find the verse reference and you'll know what that mercy is. Then, you can take that little booklet that I handed you last week, and you can go into that booklet, and then if you need to have more information about that, it's in that booklet. That way you'll have everything that you need, and then you just need to talk to your Heavenly Father about that, because it is through that kind of prayer that these mercies are going to begin to effectually work in us. We have to be reminded of them. They have to be in our mind. Look, we're, we're, do you remember long ago I said, you know, there's coming a time when it won't be enough for us to just show up here on Sunday, listen to me talk, and just wait till the next Sunday. But you know what? <clears throat> I was talking about with regard to the education. The truth is, from Romans chapter 3, it is no longer enough to just show up here, listen to me talk, wait till the next Sunday. There's coming a time when we're going to have to do something with what we've heard during the week. I should have given you this back there. Now, why am I so panicked about this? I hate to say it that way. But you know me, everything is an extreme. So why am I so panicked about this? Because... This Sonship Review on Prayer doesn't have very much longer to go. We are truly almost at the end. Today we're talking about edification prayer. 
Next Sunday, we're talking about adversity prayer. The Sunday after that, we're talking about praying for others. See, up to now, we've really been talking about how prayer about ourselves is supposed to be working. So two Sundays from now, we'll be talking about prayer for others and how does that work. And then that may be the end, or I may have one last Sunday following that to tie up all those loose ends, put it into one cogent presentation, and then, and then, and then give us something that kind of segues or moves us into Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. So you know what I'm telling you? Is we have literally three more Sundays. And then we're at the checkpoint. It means, and I've got, I've listed for you here, 18 of those mercies. Why is it important? Just, just, just think with me here for a moment and, and let me hear from you. Why is it important for those mercies to be working in us? Somebody, now you could say several things about that, but somebody give me something. Okay, but are your reasonable service of presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, that is based on these mercies. And if they're not working in us, we won't be able to do that. All right, anything else? There is something else. I think that it gives you a deeper understanding so that when you are attacked by the adversary, you know where to go to pray. Okay, okay, so, okay. so let, me, let me just jot these down. So they're the basis of service. They, they give us an understanding. Okay, anybody else? They are all common to the body of Christ, whether understood or not. That, okay, they're all, okay, they're all common to the body of Christ, and, and that is true. I'm glad Eric brought that up because, look, everything God is doing for any member of the body, He is doing for every member of the body. And boy, when you understand that, that takes a lot of those false ideas and does away with them. Remember in the old days, somebody would say, Oh, you know what? God healed me. And then you got someone else in the group thinking, Well, how come God didn't heal me? And then we got all those contrivances. Well, you didn't have enough faith. Or you've got unconfessed sin. Or you've got you know, a generational curse. Or you've got... We make all that stuff up because it really doesn't work for everybody. So, it, 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 so it, it's, it's true, but learning these mercies, and they are, those mercies are for everyone. They are. And so if, I'm, but I'm waiting to write this down because I want you to add something to that. So what is it God wants to accomplish for every single saint through these mercies? Even before we get to Romans chapter 12 verse 1. This is where I'm going. This is what I want you to think about. What is God doing? Reconciling. Okay, okay. all right. That, that's true. <laughs> he is reconciling the world unto himself. I, that's true. Uh, let me, so let me narrow my question a little bit. By having these mercies established in us, by us knowing what they are, what should we expect to be a result? I mean, I gave you... Well, let me just, let me just say it, because I don't know how to ask it to you. These mercies are meant to produce three virtues in us. They are meant... And this, and this is going to happen... Let's go back to what Eric said, that everyone is supposed to have this. this. These three virtues he wants established in all of us. And that is that our love for God will increase. 
Yes? Our knowledge of him will be of, of such a nature that it creates a relationship. You already, what is this relationship that these mercies are, are building? What, what kind of relationship? Look, you have the master-servant relationship. Then you have, oh, thank you. I, Linda jumped us right to the answer. You know, because I was thinking back in Israel's program, remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, I, I don't call you servants, I call you friends. Because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. And he said, but I'm telling you guys. And I thought about that and I thought, is it the friend-to-friend -friend relationship? But no, it's beyond that. It's the father-son relationship. And then the last thing is that we develop gratitude for what he has done for us, right? Now look, these, these are the three virtues that God is establishing in us. And even though I didn't always have this firmly enough in my mind, I certainly do now, you know, here, here let's look at the first one. Look, you've been through Romans 12 before. We've been through that. Now, it didn't, it, it didn't have the effect on us it was supposed to have because what we didn't do leading up to that didn't prime us for that effect. It didn't get us ready for that effect. So even though we wanted it and we desired to have it, we didn't have the wherewithal for those verses to really work in us the way they were supposed to. Now at the 11th hour, I am giving you something that will allow that to happen, but we're going to have to really work on it. Because if all we have left after today, 7 days to the first Sunday, 14 days to the second Sunday, 21 days to the third Sunday, and then you can count the 7 more days before we get to Romans 12.1, so you're talking about 28 days. 28 days to cover 18 mercies. That's not even enough. If all you did was do this once a day, that's not enough to cover each mercy twice. You should actually have covered each mercy hundreds of times. How long have we been in this review? This is the review. Two years. Two years for 18 mercies. Now what is that? That's two years is, is well, 300, 365 times 2, 730, divide that by 18. Just, I mean, just easy. If you call it just 20, you're talking about 5 per 100 and uh, times 7 then that's 35 if all you did was once a day. And I, I'm not telling you how often to do it. You're a son. You've got to make that decision. But I have to tell you, when I started out, I started out in the morning when I got up. I did it at night when I went to bed. If I woke up in the middle of the night, you know what? I'd just start another one or, or continue the one that I was on the last time. And then during the course of the day, those things come up. So look, your own, and then, now look, I know 35, 40. Now if you double it because you do it twice a day, now you're talking about 70. 70 is a good number, but you don't have enough time to do each one 70 times. So we have to continue to wear this hat. Are you with me? I'm going to stop saying what I'm saying now because now we're going to come to the crux of this. What I'm really after here, what all of this was about, and I'm just going to put, look, I'm going to write down Eric's everyone. We're talking about those who are saved, of course, because now I'm going to add something to this of what this is, what this is intended to do. This is not doing it. <clears throat> this is not 
it, look, I know I told it to you this way, so when you give me this answer, don't think I'm telling you it's wrong. It's just, look, when Linda said it's the basis of our service, that is absolutely correct. It's by the mercies of God that we perform our reasonable service. But, it's, but it is not just with something else in view. It is with something else in view. But before it gets to, this is, look, if this is Romans 12, 1, it is not just preparing us for the first form of doctrine in chapter 12, 3 through 8. It is preparing us for the first form of doctrine. <coughs> but it is doing something else. It's actually laying the foundation upon which the, all of these forms of doctrine will be built. <coughs> okay, so let me just go through it. And, and, we'll, and I think we'll see this as we go through. So about five weeks ago, I introduced this to relationship prayer. And that is the first kind of intelligent prayer that we need to be engaged in. And I say that because of the purpose of that prayer. The purpose of that prayer is the development of the father-son relationship. And that's an intimate relationship. This, this is beyond just being part of the family, father and son. This is being connected with what the father is doing. What, everything that's, that this is, a, that what his eternal purpose is about. Okay. So, and when we, and so here's what we're developing. We're developing, and, and I'm going to say it this way, an ever increasing love for God. Do you know what this first form of doctrine is? Someone's listening to this on the website or, or, or some recording, and they, they don't have a frame of reference for this, so I just need to say it, even though I think you know it. <clears throat> when we start out in Romans chapter 12, you are in the first of those four decision-making skills. Godly wisdom. Remember, it's wisdom... Justice, sorry, no E, judgment and equity. All right. And wisdom, these are not your Heavenly Father teaching you little pithy sayings that are bits of wisdom. His wisdom is now going to do something. Now, this is incredibly important. He is going to generate in us His love for the purpose of us now thinking about the other members in this assembly. Because that's what Romans 12, 3 through 8 is. It is generating godly love for the other members of this assembly. It's not that we don't already like each other, but, there, but outside of that, by the way, that's not a bad thing, of course, but that's not enough. When you get to the heavenly places, it will not be enough for you to look at the other members of the body of Christ and go, you know what, I really like Norma, and I feel really close to her, and we have a lot in common, but when it comes to Brianna, I mean, I like her, but we don't, you know what, I don't feel as close to her as I do. That's, that's the way human love works. You have people you're closer to, you have other people you may not feel quite so close to. Now, you, you may have some kind of attachment because you go to church with them, but, but your father isn't interested in establishing that. 
He is interested in you looking at the every member of this assembly, no matter if you're really close friends to them or you're not. He is interested in having you look at every other member of this assembly the way he looks at them. Now that doesn't mean that if Sarita is your best buddy, that she can no longer be your best buddy. That's not what God is doing here. Or if you look at Clifford and you go, Man, I can only be around Clifford a little bit. See, that's not, he's not, that's not what this is about, that suddenly you're inviting Clifford. Well, I'm just picking on Clifford, you know, but he's tough. He can take it. About, you know what, I got to, look, this is about us learning to look at everyone here the way your Heavenly Father looks at them. And I don't know if you remember this, but when we stopped in Romans 13... And Clifford, this, is, this whole review is his fault. You do know that. And he said, and by the way, I think he wears that proudly, by the way. But when he said, look, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Linda, you asked a question that day, if you remember. And you said, do you think this doctrine is working in us the way it is supposed to? You remember asking that question? And do you remember my answer? I said, even though we have made real progress as a group, this doctrine is not working in us the way it is supposed to. Part of that, look, you, look, don't blame yourselves for that. That was my fault. I didn't give you everything that you needed in order for that to become a reality. I'm, I, I take full responsibility for that. But I have told you now... And you have 28 days to do something with it. Tick tock. You know what I think of? An asteroid is hurtling toward the earth. And we have 28 days to build a rocket with a gravity tractor that will pull it enough over the next three weeks that it will actually miss earth. That's how I feel about this. This is an emergency. And so... We ha and, and while I don't want you to become anxious and worried, I want us to make wise decisions about how we utilize our time in the next 28 days as we get back to Romans 12.1. Because here's the, here's the thing all of this is leading up to. If this is meant for us to produce godly love, and the reason I call it godly love is because it is not a version of what we already know and understand. I'm not saying this to be ugly. You, you know this. But we don't have godly love generated in this assembly. I already told you that's my fault. But now we have the the, all of the things necessary that we can have godly love generated in us. But the main reason that we didn't have it before is, and someone want to fill in that blank for me? And please don't say again, it's your fault. I know it is. I know it is. We didn't have the mercies. We didn't have the mercies. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, because that's where I'm going. Because before we can love each other the way we are supposed to, the way, no, before we can love each other the way God loves us, we have to love Him the way we are supposed to. It's on the foundation of how much we love God that the doctrine gets erected. In other words, if, if the only reason we love God is because He saved us from hell, you don't have a sufficient abounding love for God for this to work. If God gave you 18 things before you got to Romans 12 that you could identify as the mercies of God, 
Our love for Him is built on a foundation of the mercies. What is that? Are all 18 mercies something you should love Him for? Are all 18 mercies something that you should know about your relationship to your Heavenly Father as His adopted son or daughter? Are all 18 mercies something to be thankful for, to have gratitude for? See, and it's these things for this that allow us now to really love Him sufficiently because God didn't give us any of these so that we could go, look, um, th this one, you know, there's about four or five in there. You know what, I don't think I love God for those, but... You know, and God and God is going to go. Yeah, don't worry about it. You can you can you can leave out about four or five of them and still get it done. Do you know why I gave you eighteen of them? Because that's what you have to have. There are uh, look. Are there going to be other things you're going to learn to love God for after Romans twelve? Yeah, but you know why I didn't give them to you until after Romans twelve? Because you don't need them in order to be able to get past Romans 12, 1. You didn't need them to be able to love the other members of this assembly. Now, so there is more yet to come, and guess what? When he gives us those, we are then going to need those for something else he's going to call on us to do. Are you with me? So see, none of this is coming out of the blue. It's all connected. So what I want us to see is, <coughs> if we're going to love each other, we have to first, the way we're supposed to, we have to love Him the way we're supposed to. And I've given you the mechanical means of developing that love relationship with your Heavenly Father, that Father-Son relationship with Him, that, that attitude of gratitude for what He has done for us, and that is to begin knowing about and understanding the mercies of God and engaging with our Heavenly Father in prayer that allows those to actually do their effectual work. See, you already have them. You already have them. They were given to you the moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. So you're not asking God to give you imputed righteousness. You're not asking God to forgive you. You're not asking God to give you the atonement you already have it. And if you know about it, which we do from the Word, see, even then you're not saying, okay, God, I want you to give me imputed righteousness. No, you already have it. But for that to really work in you, how does that happen? That happens through relationship prayer, where now you're engaging with Him, appreciating Him for what He has done knowing something about him because of this thing that he did, and then loving him out of that, that's all what has to take place before this can be built on top of it. So if we don't love him, we're going to be, we're going to be frustrated again in Romans 12, 3 through 8. So this whole thing is meant, every, that, that treasure map I gave you, that's the map that gets you to loving your Heavenly Father. So you've got to take those 18 things and you've got to get familiar with them. So look, and, and there's something about this I want to talk to you after the session is over. And I said I want to have a talk after the session is over. Because I have a question, because of where this group is. Now see, the folks in Glen Rose, I interrupted where they were to give them two weeks ago's message. And next Tuesday, I will give them last Sunday's booklet, like I gave you. Because you know what that does? That gives them about a five-month extra time to be engaging with these mercies. Unfortunately, in this group, you know, when Mark got up while going, he said, I'm the guinea pig. 
the truth is you are all the guinea pigs. <laughs> because this is where it happens first. And unfortunately, because I'm not a fully educated son, sometimes we have to go back. I, I, I know lack of planning on my part has constituted an emergency on your part. That's not the way it's supposed to be. So I'm going to talk to you about how to solve that. We'll do that right at the end. I just need your input about how to do that. Wow. This is how far we got. Okay. But do you understand this? Do you understand? This is part of a post-doctrinal exhortation. This is convincing you of why this doctrine has to be at work in us. Okay, so look, normally I would panic right now because I'm looking at, I didn't plan it this way. I would be panicking right now because I'm looking at where we are in the notes and I'm thinking now, again, there's no way I'm going to make it all the way through the notes. But I am not quite so panicked today. Do you know why? Because you need more time anyway. So, if it... If this adds one more Sunday, I don't think that will... I just need to... <laughs> yeah, that would be great if we had that. Clifford's going... Everybody on the camera is uh, watching and wondering what he said. He said, how about one more year? <clears throat> but, you know what? But we'll have a discussion about that at the end today. So I want to keep to the time here. So I want to cut this off. Let's take our break. And then we'll come back and pick them.